to this EBEC seminar. I'm really delighted to introduce David Junker. I joined his group during two years and a half, three years ago. Um, to am very happy that he's, he's here to show you what he's doing in the lab. I mean, I'm going to just go a little bit over the biography of, of David. David, I mean, he's coming from Switzerland, I think the, the degree of electronics and physics in the University of Neuchâtel as well got the PhD there. Then he moved to the IBM research lab in Zurich, he was working with Emmanuel de la Marte, and especially was working in cell photography for high resolution surface patterning and autonomous microfluidic systems. Then he went to ATH Zurich as well during for, for one year, where he was doing polymer microfabrication. I think then you moved to Japan for a while. No, no Japan was before. But oh, before yeah. okay. mm -hmm. but for a while, and finally you and in Montreal at the Biomedical Engineering Department since 2005, where he got a Canada Research Chair in Micro and Nano Bioengineering. And right now he has, a, he has a lab there. And his core interest is in exploration and miniaturization and integration in biology and medicine, which includes conception, engineering, and utilization of novel and micro nanotechnologies for manipulating, simulating, and studying oligonucleotides protein cells and tissues. Um, please, David. Okay. Thanks a lot, Matteo. So yeah, good morning. Because now in Montreal, I think it's about uh, 9 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of where I'm still sitting at. Uh, so but I think I'm a little bit sun here today. I'm doing fine. So I'm going to talk. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, talk with Matteo's place. I was really impressed by all the facilities. And I've had a really nice welcome. And so I'm going to talk to you about two things today. So self-powered capillary microfluidics and nanocontact printing. I mean, it looks like it's connected. And there are some intermediate research we're doing there, but yeah, it's somewhat of a schizophrenic talk. But, uh, it's kind of a different topics. But so I think it's a small audience. So if you have some questions or if it's kind of out of your topic, just feel free to interject. And, and then we can have here a back and forth discussion, if, if that's possible at all. OK. So I'll just give you a brief outline of my talk. I'll just go sp speak a little bit about um, disease diagnosis and biomarkers. And I'll speak about the capillary microfluidics. So that's actually work that stems from my PhD, and which we have now picked on and pushed a bit further. And from there, I'll go into speaking about how about the cell cell work. So we study cell navigation or the cell response to gradients. And we started that, but we found out that we had to do some kind of background work or reference work to optimize the surface on which our cells would, would migrate. And then I'll speak about new types of gradient, which we call digital nanodot gradients. I mean, they kind of take up some existing concepts, but we have pushed them a little bit further. OK, and I'll just give you a br brief lab kaleidoscope. So as I said, we, we kind of have this array work. And I'm going to touch that a little bit. So that's kind of where uh, Matteo was involved. And then I will speak about this part here. And this part here is our microfluidics. We have also microfluidics on thread. And then we have actually some microfluidics for gradient generation and for, for cell migration, which is kind of the bridge that I'm talking today. But because of time constraints, I won't really be talking about that. But if you have some interest, please go and visit the website. And then you'll see all, all information that's there. OK, so coming back to, to diagnosis. I mean, first talked about speaking about diagnostics. How do we assess disease? Well, most cases, I mean, we I work a lot with cancer. Still, in many cases, the cancer is detected when there is a lump. It's kind of a large lump. It's detected at your doctors. So it's, it's a really big issue in, in actually having early diagnostic tests for diseases. And so the diagnostic tests we have, the one way they operate is actually in blood. And they can go to the clinic. They have a panoply of tests that they can do with your blood. And they can try to assess the biomarkers in blood. But one of the big challenges, and why we don't have maybe more efficient biomarkers in blood, is that it's this high dynamic range of, of proteins that are in blood. And so this is kind of <coughs> our landmark studies from, from Anderson. It's an overview paper of the protein concentration in blood. And the challenge is that when you want to measure something in the blood, you have proteins that are concentrated like hemoglobin here, albumin. I'm trying to give some here too, which are 10 to the 11 uh, picogram per milliliter. So this is a logarithmic scale here. And then some of the, uh, well, some of the biomarkers might be sitting down here. So they're actually at the one picogram uh, 
one picogram per milliliter concentration level and you know, one picogram per milliliter that's actually the concentration that we can measure with current technologies nowadays. And so when you want to detect a molecule that's here, you have actually to detect it in a background of 10 to the 10, of, of, of other molecules are 10 to the 10 times more concentrated. And the way for making this kind of a bit uh, more practical or more visual for me is to think that that's, that's the same ratio, the same dynamic range between having the world population, which is about 10 to the 10, about 10 billion people, and identifying one individual, so in the background of this 10 to the 10 people around there. And when you do a diagnostic test, you want to do that in half an hour and uh, basically get your result. And actually, in actuality, that's something that can be done. That's if you go to the clinic, they have half an hour tests, and they will detect these, these biomarkers or these proteins at this very low concentration here. Now, one of the big challenges I'm not going to do too much into that, is that for many diseases we don't have accurate biomarkers. So for example, there's no cancer biomarker. You can't go to your physician and get a blood test and say, oh, your cancer is coming up. So that's why basically your cancer is still being detected when there is actually a mass. And so one of the works is basically then to try, so there's two aspects here. One is the effort to try to identify these new biomarkers so that we can actually make these tests and they are still, still that's, that's a big job that needs to be done. And then the other job is actually to have the devices that you could use at your doctor's office to then make these types of tests. And so, if this thing works, so just, so the, the, the advantage <coughs> of using blood also as biomarkers, and I'm just kind of going to quickly through this, is that for early diagnosis of disease, it's a si time sensitive issue, right? You don't know when it's going to happen. And that's where typically you want to use proteins and metabolites to detect because in the blood, typically DNA is getting degraded, so it's actually something you can detect inside of the blood. <coughs> and so both also then if you're having, again, in cancer, if you want to measure if your therapy is efficient and, or if you're having a relapse, if your cancer is coming back, again, it's something you want to measure in the blood and you want to be able to measure repeatedly. And so one of the works we did, and I'm just showing this a little bit, so if, if you have more interest, you can talk to Matteo, because he was actually the one who helped us get this rolling. Also developed this new antibody microarray platform, where one of the big issues with current antibody microarrays is cross-reactivity between reagents. So if we want to find new biomarkers, you know, we, it's very hard to know what the biomarker will be. So there's a very poor correlation between what's expressed in the tissue and what's actually expressed in the blood. And so we developed a novel spotting approach so that we can co-localize the reagents so that we avoid the cross-reactivity introduced by mixing. And by doing that, we had some preliminary results in getting a classification of disease using a panel of six proteins here. So we could classify uh, cancer patient serum here from control serum. And so that's kind of a window toward developing a diagnostic biomarker panel for early diagnosis of breast cancer. And that's something we are now continuing in the lab, and we have just got funding for pushing that further and for actually doing a larger scale study by collecting serum. And once we have identified, supposedly we are successful, we have identified one or a multiplex biomarker, then we'll have to do a diagnostic test. And for that, we want to have a, ideally a small handheld device. And as most of you probably know, this is kind of one type of format that you can get. This is a, a diagnostic test for pregnancy, and this is in the form of a simple uh, immunochromatographic strip. But that's kind of a standard. It's a microfluidic device to some extent, too. It's quite inexpensive. It's not very sensitive. It's semi-quantitative, and it has a number of limitations. And so what, our techno what we want to do now is basically develop new technologies that maintain the simplicity of this kind of format. I mean, this is a dipstick, so you can have a very fast result, but which can also can add ultimately a quantitative and a more reproducible aspect. And so we speak about microfluidic systems. Um, there have been, over the last 15 years or so, 20 years or so, there have been many, many developments. So microfluidics started a lot with integrated pumps from the MEMS field and then went to electrokinetic pumping or still a lot of people use external macroscopic pumping or this kind of soft lithography, so multiple layers to actuate the fluid or more recently digital type of microfluidics. But if you look at these systems, most of them, it's called microfluidics because the chip itself is small, but what's actually making the things run, it's large power supplies and large peripherals around your chip. And so if you want to have a chip like the, these, these things, in some, in, this in, in some way they fail actually to deliver really this compact device like basically the pregnancy test. And so we went back to, and that's kind of my old work, to, to kind of 
building on this idea of capillary effects, which is what you're having driving the liquid in this porous material, by mimicking basically the self, the self or the autonomy of trees in some way. So trees are see them everywhere. They're actually self-regulated. They pump when they need. They stop pumping when there is a drought. And so can we kind of take advantage and implement this kind of control inside of a very simple circuit, which in this case, as you can see, kind of resembles a, a tree. Also, this is just kind of a graphical system because here we have actually four independent circuits. And so these devices, they are self-powered and self-regulated, and so hence the kind of idea that they're autonomous, because that's kind of how what I think what autonomous is. And then they're actually self-contained, so there's no all these peripherals that go with it. And so the, the work, and I'm just having a few slides to give you a background here. What the, the key points here is to think about wetting and non-wetting surfaces. So we'd have the, the, the young Laplace equation, which kind of defines whether a surface here likes or doesn't like water, it's hydrophilic, so the water will spread on it, or it doesn't like water, it's hydrophilic, it coils up on it, so this will kind of push it away. And so by making a surface hydrophilic, and we can do this with a plasma, we can basically control how the liquid spreads on a surface. And when we go one step further, we make a conduit, we can have the same, we can, we can think of whether a conduit will be filling, and if, if the contact angle is less than 90 degrees, so this contact angle here, then it, the liquid will spontaneously fill this conduit here. And if the conduit is twice as small, then for the same length, you'll have, a, or for the same volume, you can drive twice as much volume uh, because the, the, by the surface energy will uh, drive you, the surface to volume ratio is twice as big in this kind of conduit, so you have twice as much energy. So which basically tells you that the smaller the conduit, the higher the pressure <coughs> generates to drive in the liquid. And if you go a bit more sophisticated, you can start to have angles in time inside of your circuit. So this would then affect the contact angle, make it less favorable to, s to fill the circuit. Or if you have this type of construction, at this point, unless the liquid actually perfectly wets, unless the contact angle is zero degree, this would act as a valve and actually stop the liquid inside of the channel. Until we can already see the emerging some properties, so we can kind of tune by tuning the geometry and the contact angle, we can kind of try to control how the liquid would fill inside of these channels. And so I think the guiding effect is the surface to volume. So the smaller your circuit, the higher the capillary effect. And then by tuning the surface chemistry, we can then also control the flow of the liquid. And maybe from a view in first year physics, I think that's where I had to do these experiments. I didn't really like that much that experiment because it never gave the values we were supposed to get. So it was this idea, you put a capillary inside of a liquid and then it rises. And then there was like a value it had to rise, which you could calculate here delta P2 gamma, so that's the surface tension divided by R. And then of course, there's this, if, if your liquid doesn't wet perfectly or if you have a bit surfactant in your liquid, then you won't really get that value. But nonetheless, I mean, that's the basics of the driving force inside of the channels. And so if your contact angle is higher than 90, they will actually push it back. So kind of be the same idea than before. Now we have rectangular channels in most of microfluidic systems, so you have like D and W here, the depths and the weights which come into play, but I don't want to go too much to these equations. What I'd like to focus on is this one here. So what we have in the end, so it's the, the, the flow rate inside of a circuit is the difference in pressure, this capillary pressure, divided by the resistance of the circuit. And for this is really reminiscent of the electrical equation. So the, the, the current is the tension divided by the resistance. So it's like an electrical equation that describes essentially the, the, the flow in a circuit, except, except of course that here the tension arises when the liquid fills in the circuit, so it's dependent at what position your front has in the circuit, and your resistance also changes as your liquid fills inside of the circuit, right? In electronics all you do is you add an electron, you put one out. In liquid you actually really have to fill in your liquid, and so the resistance can also be quite high there. But so using this, we can still take this analogy and then think, OK, now we have this. Can we start to build microfluidic circuits, capillary circuits, by playing, basically making a library of elements and then trying to build them up in a logical manner like you would build up an electrical circuit? And so that's kind of the, the line of thinking we have developed and that we have pushed in the last few years. I'm going to show you a few elements and then how we can put them together to make a circuit that can be used then for a diagnostic purpose. And so the first thing is the capillary pump. And so the pump is what is used to flush your sample, to flush enough samples that you can actually have the binding occurring on the surface. And one form of pumps we adopted, and I'll show you videos in a second about that, is these pumps with arrays of posts inside of the pump, so like this one here. 
that when you have a wide pump like this, one of the big challenges is that your liquid, for example, goes along the edge. You can trap bubbles inside your pump and because the pump is used to meter the liquid, so it defines how much volume goes through. Suppose the pressure and the volume. So if you trap bubbles, of course, then it's not reliable. And for I don't have, I think you will, well, I could show you a video of that, but I don't think I have it here. And so one thing we did is want to engineer the pumps and the posts here in such a way that the liquid would actually fill in a very defined manner along between the gaps here. So it will fill along these gaps and then fill these ones. And these would actually act like, like a retention, the stop valve I explained you earlier on. So the liquid fills here and comes in, kind of stops. And then by designing the pump, we can have one pump which is like a serpentine. So by having like these, these obstacles at the end, so the liquid front will fill in a serpentine manner. But the boat flow, of course, will actually go straight, as shown by the arrow. So we have like a, a front that fills like this and the boat that goes like straight. And so this actually doesn't add resistance to the circuit because that's often not desired. And here it's the same idea, but except here we have actually different sizes on the edge. And so the liquid always fills from one edge. So this edge is narrow, has a high capillary pressure. Liquid will first fill here, and then it will start to fill each of these gaps. And so I'll show you now that this actually is something we can do. And these are kind of four videos that run. So we have two serpentine pumps. And so the video rate is not exact, but you can see here's the back and forth, essentially. And here the same. And here we just twist the angles. And it's a nice fitting so that it fills really from one end to the other without trapping a bubble. And then this side, we have a pump. You have a narrow edge here. And so the pump, it's not perfect, but this doesn't trap a bubble. It typically starts filling more from one edge. And so we have a way of really controlling how the filling from fills inside of these different pumps. And then because the boat flow just goes through there, it's, it's a large volume, constant pressure, but doesn't add very significant resistance to the overall circuit. So that's the first element. Then now another element is this, it's what we call a, a, a trigger valve. And some people have already worked on trigger valves. But there's two issues with trigger valves. In a, in a 2D, it's like I showed you here, in a 2D system, if you come here, it's the liquid stops. But if you actually have a second channel, you can use a second channel to, to, to break this, this interface and actually trigger your liquid. But when you do this actually in 3D, the problem is you have a sailing on the bottom. And the bottom and the sailing also create a capillary pressure. And so you want to stop, but actually it doesn't stop. And that's what I'm just going to illustrate here <coughs> with this movie. And so here you have the liquid coming from the side channel. And well, it follows along the top and bottom edge and fills inside of the channel. And so it, it's actually not. It's, it's the valves fail. And so people have done really high aspect ratio channels to try to overcome that. But if you want to do something in polymer, which is what you want in the end, then that's not really a practical solution. And so what we did here is then a system, so it's, it's still in silicon here, where we now we add by deep reactive ion etching. We have two reactive etching steps. And you will see here, if you, look, if you focus on this part here, you have actually channels that's more shallow. So when the liquid comes here, it kind of stops at this edge. And here, it's also stopped on this side. And then what we do, we use a cover. We use a PDMS cover. It's slightly hydrophobic, so that the liquid at the edge, it can't follow the hydrophobic cover. And so it's really being stopped at this interface here. And I'll show you in this movie here that this works. And you'll have to trust me on one point, is that this was filled. And then we actually waited for 20 minutes. But so I cut that part of the video. <laughs> and to make it not too boring for you. And then here we have the next liquid that comes and that can trigger this flow here. And so it's laminar flow here. So you nicely see, and here we have much larger flow. That's why this one is, is nicely stopped here. But so we have a way, basically, now of putting something in a, s in, a, in a system, storing it there until a sample comes and then triggers the flow of that system. So that's the second element. Then the third or element I'd like to show you is what we call a capillary retention valve. It's actually a concept we had developed before. But here we want to have, went one step further, we will have retention valve with different thresholds, which means they hold the liquid back. But if we apply enough pressure, they will actually, they will actually break. So it's kind of a break. It's a, it's a fuse, uh, if you like, in this way too. And so the way we can tune that, again, the smaller the constriction, the higher the capillary pressure. So if we have one user constriction, so that will kind of hold the liquid back. It won't be able to de-wet from this part. If we make it a bit longer, then that can kind of help. From the equation, it shouldn't help at all. In practice, it does. But what obviously helps is you make it narrower, then this will have a higher capillary retention. And if you make narrow and long, then that actually gives you the best retention. And I'll show you what this means with this video here, where we have six channels. And first, we'll fill them. <coughs> and then they will be drained sequentially. And so 
So this is a this is a video of his fluorescent solutions, and then you will see. So it's kind of you have a uh, sample here. It's pumped into the it's it's filled into the pump, which then starts to suck. And then here you have different retention valves, and this is the weakest because there's essentially no retention valve. And then you can see this one is draining first, and then it will be this one, and then this one, and then this one, and and so forth. And so now we have a way, a pre-programmed way of actually filling, in this case, six liquids in a predefined sequence, just by geometrically encoding which part will actually be drained. one doesn't want to okay and that's it okay and now we have actually these three building blocks and I think that's actually enough to now make something useful with it and so what we want to do is uh, in the context of assays we want to have a one-step program sequential triggering of multiple reagents we want to have a flow reversal. I'll show you how we can integrate that. And that's actually interesting because with a flow reversal, we can have a different flow rate for flowing the sample. Because when we flow the sample, we want to take that low concentration. We want to flow it for enough time to give for the binding of your analyte. And so that needs a relatively slow flow and over a long uh, extended period of time. So that's where you can use a capillary pump. But then when you want to flush it and maybe apply the detection antibody for making a sandwich assay, then we have a lot of reagents, so we can just flush it much faster and also for a much shorter time. And so we can then, by having a flow reversal, we can have a circuit with different flow resistance and basically integrate that to make an immune assay. And so that's how the circuit then will look like. So we'll have the different elements I showed you before. We'll have a loading port. We have a retention valve, which prevents the whole thing from kind of drying out. Then we have a capillary trigger valve. These are reaction chambers. So these are our two zones where we'll actually have the assay occurring. And then we have the same capillary trigger valves here. We have four of them. We have a flow resistor. We have a capillary pump, which is our metering system. We have four side channel reservoirs, which the, 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 the burst valve I just showed in the video before. And so the way this will work, we can now pre-fill our different reagents here for our assay. So this could be a, a <coughs> say a, a rinsing solution, a detection antibody, uh, biotinylated or some silver, some, some fluorescent amplification system or maybe another rinsing solution. This is kind of up to you. Then we have four trigger valves, so they will all stop here and we have to kind of meter that they nicely stop at this end. And so now we want to do actually our reagent, our sample assay. We, we just load the sample here and then you can actually walk away. And at this point the sample flows here, it will go through the pump because here you have a high flow resistance, it will actually have a slow flow rate over here that you can optimize for having the right sensitivity. And once then this circuit is filled, it comes back here, triggers this valve, and then the liquid, the excess liquid here, so it's kind of self-correcting, will just be directly routed into this side channel here, into this pump. And once that's all drained, then what will happen, you will start to drain each of your four reagents here, which can then basically flush over your sample and complete your assay. And I'll show you this here. I have a video in color of how far we went. So you have the same design than before. You have the close-up view of this part here, which is just here. So we fill in these four colors. And then you fill in what's kind of the sample here. And so it fills in the pump. So this is an old pump design, which is doesn't fill as nicely as the new ones. But here we didn't have any bubble trapped. And then once this comes here, you will then start to drain this one very fast. You can see how it's accelerated here. And then you will drain these four side channels one by one. Okay, and so that's kind of all the steps that you need to do an assay. So instead of, I mean, I, okay, I haven't really shown you the ELISA, but for the ones who do ELISA, you have to do all these piping steps in and out. Here you only apply your four things, you can walk away, and your whole system would run. And so we have started to do some immunoassays with that. Um, so our limit of detection is not really where we want to be, so we're still working on it. And one of the challenges we have right now is that we're using PDMS also as a circuit, and so because the PDMS becomes hydrophobic over time, 
it's we having still issues with basically keeping the hydrophilicity and so we're actually moving to polymer surfaces polymer materials so we can better control the surface chemistry and have something that's a bit more stable okay and that's actually the first part of my talk and so we'll switch gears as they say so we'll speak about the second part which is about the which is about the, the nano patterning and the surface guidance and so in this case, I mean, so we use some microfluidics to make gradients too, and but here I'm going to talk about the part that does the surface gradient. And so gradients is what basically is very important in to guide cells in vivo, and you can have different sizes of gradients. You can have attractive gradients or repulsive gradients, and here's kind of showing neurons that would guide the growth cone to go a certain place. And so this is important in development, it's important in regeneration, and it's very fundamental to many effects. And the, the, the collaborator, Tim Kennedy, which is from the Montreal Neurological Institute, he is a specialist of Netrin-1, and so Netrin-1 is a gradient molecule the, which is expressed in the, in the spinal cord here, and which makes this red gradient along here, and this guides then these kind of uh, um, commissural neurons to come along here and cross over the midline here and then go actually down the neural line. And okay, there's a receptor involved, it's called DCC, I'm not going to go into details because that's kind of beyond my expertise. And so this binds, and this is what essentially guides these, these cells to go down along this gradient. And so people want to try to understand how these gradients work. You, when you want to do that in vivo, that's very kind of complicated because you have so many other molecules that are diffusing around, and that's why you like to do these kind of tests in vitro. And so we kind of went into that direction to try to make gradients, and we did some gradients. I'm going to explain you how we did them. But our first experiments were actually rather unsuccessful because we made these gradients, but we didn't have any cell response to the gradients at all. And what we started to think about is, you know, what's, okay, there's the grain, but there's the background, there's the reference <coughs> surface where the cells are growing to on, and that we use PLL as surface. And it happens actually cells really like PLL. It's kind of, I mean, they stick to it. There's no really, sometimes they even make actually in, uh, focal adhesions on PLL and, and have a whole group which is making beads and with PLL where, where cells can actually make synapses on them. But so they, they pretty have a strong adhesion. And so we reason maybe that's kind of an issue. And so the way to think about it is that we, we did then these tripe assays where we would kind of test which surface the cell likes. And the way you do that, you just look, have this, uh, this surface and pattern a stripe here and pattern the, back the reference or background surface. And then you can count how many cells would be on a stripe or how many cells would be off a stripe. And then to avoid confusion, we'd kind of discount the cells that are kind of stuck together. And what we found is that depending on what kind of surface we use, and here actually the, the, the green surface, it's, uh, it's netrin-1 here, on, on, uh, which is then basically guiding the cells to go on here. So it's the same green surface, but now just by changing the background here, we found that we could completely reverse the behavior of the cells. So you know, if you use this background, you'd say, oh, these cells really like netrin-1. If you use this reference surface, you'd say, oh no, the cells really don't like netrin-1. They're repulsed by netrin-1. And so, okay, well, what does that tell us? I mean, maybe for some of you it's clear, but to me, from the literature, you always read things are attractive to something. But really, when you do an uh, a test like this, what you're actually evaluating is the, the, the preference for a cell for one surface versus another surface. Or one way to express it, one surface is more permissive than the other surface. And so to kind of a bit more systematically explore that, we took one reference surface, which is widely used, polyalizing. So it has this amino group here, which kind of you can coat on surface, especially on silicon surface, by electrostatic adsorption. And then we combine it with a polyalizing that is functionalized with PEG, which is commercially available. And we started kind of mixing these two things together to see if we could kind of tune how the cells stick to a surface. And so this is kind of experiments that we have been doing for a while. So it's a reference surface with mixtures of PO and PEG. So we start like here with 0% PEG and 100% PDL. And you can see that almost all the surface here are sticking on the, on the background. And then as we start to mix these different things, so it's 50, 50, 75, 25, 90, 10, 95, 5, you can see that the cells then start to more and more migrate onto the stripes. And I think these are, uh, I believe these are still, these are fibronectin types here with C2, C12 cells of cell myoblast. And okay, what you're seeing down here is kind of the numerical quantification of a number of experiments. 
the bar here, that's that's the experimental that's the experimentally determined occupancy of the stripe. So the stripe surface is only a fraction of the overall surface, only about 20%. And when we randomly superpose a stripe on a surface with cells, then that's, th that's typically the distribution you would get on a random surface without actually any pattern. And so you can see that for 50-50 is kind of the spot where the cells are, are just as much liking the stripes as they would like the stripes of fibronectin as they would like the stripes of PEG PDL surface. And so to, to, to actually do this experiment in a systematic way, so you can see we have like developed well, this kind of array of surfaces. I mean, you could argue what are the right percentages you should choose. We have this kind of well plate, so we can pattern these stripes and have all the combinations at once and do basically rapid a number of tests. And when we, we had also a bit of a look at the, at the microscopic scale. So what you can see if here we have 100% PDL surface, you can see well-developed focal adhesions and actin networks. When it's pure PEG, the cells kind of round up and often kind of die. If you're 75, 25, you can see that in this case, you have a morphology that pretty much resembles a bit the one you would have on a pure fibronectin surface, showing that um, well, the less permissive, obviously, the less focal adhesion you have, which kind of is makes sense in this whole context. Now, taking this a bit more in a functional assay, and one of the issues we had was to show, so metrin is known as a guidance, as a diffusible molecule. Biologists know that's also something that gets absorbed in the extracellular matrix. But we had really had problems to actually define whether metrin was actually guidance cue in an absorbed way. By, and we patterned it by microcontact printing. So I'll, I'll have a slide on that. It's okay if you have neurons, it's actually a bit more sophisticated issue. And so we wanted them to see if neurons basically are binding to this netrin. So neurons, you can have the, uh, the, the soma, the cell body, off, and then the axon going on the stripe, which kind of is a strong indication that it responds strongly to the stripe. You can have the soma on, axon on. So if randomly it's kind of sets on the stripe and the soma is somehow a random event, then, then that shows it likes it. The, other op the opposite would be if the soma is on and the axon goes off, that tells you <coughs> the axon really doesn't like to be on the stripe. <coughs> and if it's off, off, that just tells you, well, it's, it's, it might be the same than before. Okay, and, and this is what actually what convinced our biologists that this was actually a really worthwhile approach because by using now these surfaces and by using, again, the surface here with 75% PEG and 25 PDL, we had a very strong difference here between soma off and axon on between a netrin pattern surface and IgG. So this is the one where we have netrin on the stripe and this is the IgG, it's a negative control. And here you have the percentage of slides where the soma is off and the axon on. It's like 50% whether in the IgG case it's a very small fraction and, and there's really statistical significant difference. And, and vice versa here, this is exactly the opposite. And to actually really show that this was a functional effect, not just kind of stickiness, we blocked, we blocked the DCC receptor, um, and then they show that they become, they, they're not different anymore. Well, that's the control, where we actually have a response, then that's when the receptor is blocked, we don't have a response. And then that's, well, in one case, I think that's, that's an inhibition of a pathway, and that's an inhibition of a pathway which is not really inhibiting the right pathway, so it's expected that you'd have a response again of the netrin. So it's all confirming that really it's the netrin binding uh, that is being allowed. I mean, the, the netrin binding is the key, the key effect in making the choice assay in this case. Okay, and so now coming back to gradients, so what's what we wanted to do? One way of doing gradients, so you can do continuous gradients, and there's many people doing that. One of the challenges with continuous gradients is actually very hard to really quantify your gradient because often people use fluorescence, but fluorescence is not quantitative. You can have quenching effects and so on. And so people started developing this called digital gradients where you now pattern spots and change the spacing between the spots to make a gradient on the surface. And so these are some examples of gradients where different types of density of spots or stripes or lines are used. And if you look at the dynamic range of these gradients, which is the, the highest density div divided by the lowest density, you have one which is 8, 10, so it means you have 10 times more dense at the top, or in this case of a nano pattern gradient, a dynamic range of 63. So this is nice, but actually in biology, people believe the dynamic range is more of the order of a thousand or even more, and so these really fall short in this respect. 
And so what we then saw is that what we saw is that all these gradients, when they did the spacing, they only changed <coughs> the spacing of their dots in one direction, as you will see here. Oops. For example, here, right, on, in, the gradient is in this direction, and the spacing changes in this direction. Here, it's it's the same thing. The dots are actually growing, but the change is only in one direction. And so what we came about is to change the spacing in two directions. So the gradient is in one direction, but the spacing changes both along the x-axis and along the y-axis. And so before, they had like a dynamic range of 100. So by doing, of course, two directions, it's 100 times, well, you could go almost, no, it was 63. So by doing, changing the di density along two axes, you can have 63 by 63, which is about 3,600. And this kind of the dynamic range we can then achieve in this type of gradient. Now this looks kind of simple and straightforward, but okay, there's a whole bunch of algorithms you need to develop to actually make that happen. And the way we did it was to make boxes. So we have like boxes and inside of a box we have a certain gradient density and that's how then the spacing is defined. But then of course as you go along your gradient you have to readjust your box size and, re and then rematch with the gradient density. So it took a few iterations to get actually where we really wanted. And so but then by doing that, we can have the highest density coverage, full coverage, to the maximal spacing here, 11 micrometer. And this is, was just chosen for, so that the cells could actually see it. We could do, of course, much larger, but then it would not be biologically relevant. So that's, that's the nice <coughs> thing for designing. And then the next thing is how to print these, these gradients. And okay, uh, I'm going a bit fast here, but so you can do PDMS printing. <coughs> but if you do PDMS printing directly with a stamp like this, and you would have these large gaps, and your stamp would collapse. So you can do this printing of these gradients. And so the, the classical method that can be used, is, or the method that has been developed, is called liftoff printing, which is what we are adopting here. And with liftoff printing, you can have a flat stamp. And I'll just go jump to here, where you basically have a flat uh, a master here. You remove the proteins you don't want. And then you print it on a glass substrate, the flat stamp, so you don't, no ha don't have any issues with collapse. And then you can transfer your pattern in this way. Now, if you want to do that, you still need a silicon master stamp to do it. So that's how people have been doing. But I mean, a silicon master costs $2,000. And each time you remove the proteins, it kind of gets contaminated. So you have only a few prints to do. And so what we developed is actually an, ad an additional replication step where we take the silicon master, replicate it into PDMS, replicate the PDS in NOA, so that's a polymer, it's a UV glueable polymer, and then use this polymer as a master. And so we had to play around to actually be able to make an efficient liftoff, but by doing this method now we can, from one silicon wafer, we can do several hundreds of NOA replicates, and then with each replicate you can do at least one print. So we can actually have, the nice thing is now we can do these nano patterns where the ultimate cost for one stamp is just a few dollars, and then I'll come back on one stamp, you can have many gradients, so the cost per gradient is literally a few cents. So here are then the kind of prints we can get. So here you can see these different boxes. These are AFM pictures of, I think in this case was IgG proteins that were printed here. You can kind of see with the globules, which we believe are, are, uh, are the, the IgG molecules. And so here are 200 nanometer spots, but we have been able to print down to 100 nanometer using these, these polymer stamps. And in the first biological experiment here is now the response of C2C12 myoblasts that respond to the RGD spots, where you can see that kind of the actin filaments overlay with the, with the patterns here. And this, yeah, this paper has now finally been accepted. It's been a bit back and forth a few times. It's small. And actually, Matteo is also co-author on that one. That's the work that started still while he was in the lab. And then the second experiments where now we started really printing a gradient. We had here, in this case, again, C2C12 cells, which, which are exp expressing the, the GCC receptor. And we were printing um, netrin here in this case on the surface in the same gradient than before. I mean, you can't really see it because of the resolution is too low. And then what you're looking at here is the cells after 20 minutes after seeding. And so the number of cells then on average per gradient, there's several, several tens or hundreds of gradients that were looked at. It's 133, and then after 18 hours, we look at the distribution of the cells on the gradient, so we have less cells because some of the cells kind of migrate out of the gradient into the surrounding, and we look then at the distribution of the cells on the, on the surface. And so that's from several hundred experiments. The 20 minute distribution is kind of the blue, li is the blue line here, so you can see it's kind of randomly distributed over the surface, whether after several hours or 18 hours, you have a strong migration or accumulation of cells 
at the top of the grain, indicating that there is directed migration towards this part. And we did, of course, controls then with just negative IgG surface, and there you, you basically don't see any directed migration. And so now we are at the point where we want to develop this into neuronal guidance experiments too. And so one of the things we just have some our first live uh, live cell imaging videos that came out. Um, I, well, I could show you if you're interested. They're just still a bit rough. But what we're also doing is actually redesigning these gradients. And so we are now having a nice software where basically we can make linear gradients, so we have an optimized software that can easily do that, so we can adjust the slope, make gradients with different slopes, we can make exponential gradients, we can make um, well, whatever function you want, so there's also a, the a possibility of doing non-monotonic gradients, the things that go up and down and try to challenge the cells in different ways. And then what's really interesting, I'll show that in the next slide, so on one, we'll do one silicon mass, we'll have 100 gradients, each 400 by 400 micrometer wide, and these 100 gradients can be printed at a rate of a few, oops, that's not what I wanted to show you, can be printed in a matter of a few, mm, a few seconds, so it's a 20 second print, you'll get 100 gradients with a few million points, and then if you do, I don't know, you can put them in the incubator and see how your cell migrates and basically analyze the results. So we have a really nice high throughput method now to, to analyze response to different surface, cell, uh, cell response to surface pattern. And that's what I want to conclude, so I showed you basically two different parts of our research. So the first was with capillary microfluidics for point of care diagnostics, so we kind of tried to create li fluid logic in the same way as electrical circuits and try to build up circuits in this way where we can control flow rate, volume and sequence of multiple reagents. And our application here is, has been immunoassays, so we want to go towards, this, towards having like a diagnostic where you just put the sample in and things flow, everything flows autonomously. And we have a simple immunoassay demonstration and we're working to get something better here. And then I showed you in the second part the nanocontact printing for cell haptotactis, so surface response. And so you have this low cost nanopatting of million dots down to 100 nanometer size. We have also really worked on the background, so to speak, in a, to, to tune the permissivity. And so in the last readings I showed you, that was a 75 25% PDL PEG surface. And then we can make this nice digital grade, nano dot gradients where we can have now different shapes and challenge the cells in different ways and see basically how they would respond. And so with that, I want to thank the team, which is actually doing all the work. And so the person that is doing all the gradients is Sebastian here. The person who did the microfluidics is uh, Ruzbe, but I think you saw a picture before. And then all the funding agency, and then I want to also talk my thank my collaborator Tim Kennedy at the MNI, and then all of you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions.